Good morning, church family. Yay, my mic is on. So there's nothing more nerve-wracking than standing back there thinking, did I actually turn my mic on? Because there was no way for me to know. I want to welcome you to this morning Sunday service, and I am so glad that you are joining us. I have some really good news for you this morning. Some really great news. How many of you could use some good news this morning? I hope all your hands shoot up. I have great news for you this morning, but I want to introduce you, myself, to you. My name is Melissa, and I am a staff pastor here at Turning Point. I am a mother to three beautiful girls in the front row, and they're going to be very glad that I pointed them out. I am a wife to a pretty awesome guy. He's okay. And I'm a writer. I'm a hiker. I'm a camper. I'm an insatiable reader. I love to read. But what I love the most is that I am a woman who is desperately in love with her Lord and Savior, and I love to share that with you. And on that note, it's a privilege for me this morning to be doing the continuation of our sermon series of Life on Mission, and this is the part where I'm completely transparent with you. It is not easy to get up in front of a cavernous room full of people and see all your beautiful faces, by the way, staring back at me. But it is not an easy thing to share a message. And, and so I'm here this morning. I ask for grace and patience with me. Um, but what is easy is sharing my love of the Lord and talking about how he has called us to a life of fruitfulness in him. And so I'm going to ask you to do something for me. I'm going to ask you to pray for me right now as I pray for you. So will you please join me as I pray? Lord, we invite your spirit in this morning. We are so grateful for this chance as a church family to come together and to worship you first and foremost, to acknowledge that you are our God and our King and that you are with us and you love us and you give us good things. So I pray this morning that your word will go forth and that you will do great things and challenge us and encourage us and give us the wisdom to deliver it. And I pray this in your awesome name, Jesus. Amen. So we've been taking Turning Point's mission statement and we've been breaking it down into bite-sized chunks and then tasting it in light of scripture. And our mission statement is this, and I hope you're able to say it right along with me that you've heard it enough. Do whatever it takes to help all people have a relationship with Jesus. These are Jesus followers who know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. And Pastor Josh started off this sermon series you may remember this with the illustration of his beep beep. How many of you remember the beep beep message? Okay, so I too communicate with my horn when I drive. But um, I am not as graceful as he is. I like to lay, I believe fully in communicating loudly. If I'm gonna use my horn, I'm going to use my horn. And so I lay it on. So this morning my message is a honk honk. It's not a beep beep. And I've also learned my lesson because I use my horn freely. Oftentimes I'm laying it on someone who's going really slow and then they turn into the turning point parking lot. I'm sure you've had, and then I'm turning in behind them. And so if that was you that I've ever honked at, I'm asking for your forgiveness and for you to drive a little bit faster. So then Pastor Hannah shared about do whatever it takes to help all people and by all people, what does it mean to love all people? How can we be in the world, but not of the world? And how God calls us to love people, and that often takes us to dark and uncomfortable places. And then last week, Pastor Josh finally spoke about knowing God. And this morning, I get to speak on our next one, which is find freedom. And this next verse that I'm going to share with you is my exclamation point of the morning. So if you're taking notes, I hope you are. I want you to put an exclamation point behind this. Or if you're using our church app, I don't know if you can actually do that, but try to put an exclamation point. It is this, Galatians 5.13. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. This is my incredibly good news for you this morning. For some of you who have walked through those doors, that is the very reason that the Lord brought you here this morning. The very reason that you are sitting in these seats today. All of us should thrill to hear these words, to know that Christ created you to be free and intends for you to live an abundant life in that freedom. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. So what does that even mean? So freedom is a strong word and it's synonymous with other words like independence, liberty, safety, opportunity, and when I looked up the word freedom in the Webster's Dictionary, it gave me 17 different meanings, and I'm not going to rattle off all 17 to you, but I did look in Scripture, 
into what the Bible says freedom is. Now, the word freedom is mentioned 66 times in 12 different translations, and it basically means this. Real freedom is knowing that we have escaped the ultimate consequences and guilt of our sin through Jesus Christ. Freedom is living a life where we can approach his throne of grace with confidence. Jesus himself said this, therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. So ultimately, the definition of freedom is Jesus. There are three facts that I want you to know this morning about freedom. Number one, people have been searching for freedom for thousands of years. The quest for freedom is found throughout the theme of the entire Bible from Genesis all the way up to Revelation. In fact, three chapters into the story of creation, we see that humanity gave up its freedom by choosing to rebel against God. And from that moment on, from that moment forward, uh, the perfect freedom that God had created in the Garden of Eden was gone. And the long-term effects of that for all of us were both physical and spiritual. And since that moment of sin, people have been grappling and groping for freedom from that day until us sitting in the seats this morning. It is a timeless struggle and it's an ancient burden. Number two, God's answer to our freedom has always been Jesus Christ. So when Jesus began his ministry here on earth, he announced that he was the one that God's people had been waiting for since the fall of humanity. And he did this by reading a particular passage from the book of Isaiah. And this was a passage that his listeners knew was referring to the Messiah, who is the savior of the whole world. And I love this. I can imagine the disdainful looks of the Jewish leaders as Jesus stood up and he opened up that scroll to the place that was already marked out for him to read, the held breath of all the people in the room as they were gathered to hear those beloved words, that baited moment of humanity as this new teacher stood up and they were confused and he read words that were written hundreds of years earlier. And these were words that spoke of a new freedom to come. And when Jesus read these words, he was saying that freedom has arrived and the freedom would come through him. And it was this. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And may this next part be true of all of us in this room. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So this was Jesus's drop the mic moment. But more than that, this was the world's first glimpse of freedom that was given. Number three, Jesus came to free us from death, sin, and anything that enslaves us. This is where we're gonna camp a little bit on this point. The core message of the gospel is that Jesus Christ, he rescues us from the slavery of sin and he offers true freedom in this life and in the life to come. And I'm gonna continue the illustration that Pastor Josh started last week of the four cups of Passover. And it's this, Jesus came to free us from death, sin, and anything that enslaves us, which introduces our next cup, the cup of deliverance, freedom. So to recap, the four cups of Passover are a stunning representation of the promises that God wants to do inside of you. And these were promises that he had for the Jewish people back then, but they are the same promises that he has for you today. So not just them then, but us now. So each of the four cups are mentioned as the four I wills. And to this day, the Jewish people, they read this following scripture as they partake of those four cups at Passover. Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from the yoke of the Egyptians. So Pastor Josh talked about the first cup, which is the cup of sanctification, salvation, an awesome cup. The second cup is the cup of deliverance, freedom. And this cup targets that Egypt 
that is in all of you. So the Israelites, they were a group of people that were dominated by the Egyptians, but even after they left the brutality of the Egyptians, they were still dominated by fear, by unbelief, by sin, by dependence on something else besides God, and they were still slaves. So the first, I will. I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. It's to save you. And it's fundamentally different than the second, I will, which is I will free you from being slaves to them. So now that we are saved, we need to get the Egypt out of us. We need to experience deliverance. So God promised to deliver the children of Israel from the slavery that they were under and to set them free from Egypt. And here is why. Because even though they were not slaves anymore, they still thought like they were slaves and they still acted like they were slaves. They grumbled against God. They doubted the provision of God. They sought refuge apart from God. And even though you are no longer a slave to sin, you're still thinking like a slave. You can be free spiritually. You can be living totally for God and still shackled in the chains of your sin. In fact, 87% of people don't reach the redemption part of the third cup because they're stuck in this part. God did not make you this way, and he never intended for you to stay this way. God is taking all of you on a spiritual journey. I don't care if you've loved Jesus for 40 years or if you've decided to follow Jesus for four days. You are on a spiritual journey, and we need that cup of deliverance. So the cup of deliverance is for anyone who is struggling with their sinful nature and for people whose pasts keep limiting their future. The, the deliverance is different from salvation. So salvation is like that. It's just that easy. You believe and you're saved. It's awesome, isn't it? There's nothing more that you need to do. You believe in your heart. You confess with your mouth. You are saved. That's it. So if salvation takes care of your eternity. But deliverance determines your quality of life while here on earth. Salvation is instant, but deliverance is a process. So the second cup is all about us changing. So how does this look or what do I mean by this? So you as a human being, you may not have realized this, but you are a triune being. So if you look at Genesis 1, 27, it says this. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So we are body, soul, and spirit. And this is what I mean by that. Your body is your physical self. Your soul, so that's your mind, your will, your emotions, and then your spirit. That's the part of us that's like God. So let's break it down. Let's look at our bodies first. As you all are up here looking at my body, it's so funny when I say it. Let's look at our bodies. I think we can all agree that our bodies have issues, right? I mean, not only does it grow old, but your eyesight fails you, your hearing fails you, your teeth fail you. You can't do cartwheels anymore, I don't know why. And then your flesh is also riddled with selfish wants. I want, I want you to understand my heart behind this and what I mean by this. We eat what we want to eat, even though we shouldn't eat it, right? We're driven by lust. Our body has appetites and urges, and our flesh is weak and very willing. We don't want our bodies making our life choices for us, right? We don't want our bodies in charge. So the next part is your soul. So your soul is your emotions and your feelings and your independent strong will, and some of you have a lot more emotions than other people, and that's all right. So you don't want your soul person making these decisions because the person who allows their emotions to lead, leads a reckless life. The book of Proverbs is rife with admonitions about those fools who allow emotions to rule, and I love this one, I quote it all the time, Proverbs 29, 11, a fool vents all his feelings, but a wise man holds them back. So you don't want your soul making your decisions. You don't want your emotions and your feelings to make your next choice for you, your next step. So that leads us to the third one, which is your spirit. And this is the part of us that is like God because God created us in his image and God is spirit. And this is the eternal part of us. We can't take our bodies to heaven, right? All right hopefully all of you are glad about that. We cannot take these bodies to heaven with us. When we get saved, our spirit is made perfect. It is renewed, 
It is empowered. This is cup one. This is salvation. It is instant. Jesus cleansed you. He expunged every stain of sin from your spirit completely, not just a little bit, the moment that you accepted him. There is nothing momentary about his gift of forgiveness and the washing white as snow that happens when you accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. But the rest of you, thank you, I love that. The rest of you needs work. Your natural man or woman needs work. So the above two, your body and your soul, they need to catch up. When you get saved, the other two, they have issues. The spirit must influence the other two, but they can't do it unless it's stronger. Your body and soul cannot be in charge. That's where you are led by eating, by suicide, depression, anxiety, fear, promiscuity, gossip. Christians who love God and they're going to heaven are still dealing with their anxieties, their eating disorders, their lusts. They're still dealing with their fears. And God does not want you to stay there. So that leads me to our three blessings of cup two. And the first one is this, victory over sin. So sin is so as discouraging and it's crippling, it scuttles you. And sin can be found in the things that you do to yourself. I want you to think about your habits, your attitudes, your addictions. So you do things that you shouldn't, and the devil, man, he loves this. He loves to torment you with thoughts like, well, I thought you loved Jesus. I thought you followed him. A true believer in Jesus would not have sinned the way that you just sinned. And I want you to take deep comfort in this next verse because even the great apostle Paul totally understood, and he was under the same discouraging, crippling thoughts and sins. Romans 7. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, your spirit, evil is right there with me, your body and soul. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law at, of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Many of us have got to take the steps of victory once and for all. And the second blessing, healing from wounds. So this is defined as negative events that happen to you. So the first one, the victory over sin, these are sins that you do to yourself. The second blessing is looking at is healing from wounds that have been done to you by others. And this is usually not your fault. It could be rejection from a divorce. It could be a tragedy that you've experienced in your life. Maybe you've lost a spouse or you've lost a child or maybe you've suffered abuse from the hands of another. And this area, I want you to understand this, this area is the devil's playground in your life and he wants you to get all tangled up and snarled up in this area and he wants to get a foothold because many of you get stuck here and you never see the light of day of cups three and four, which is restoration and fulfillment. And the devil is looking for a foothold and these wounds in your life, they are a ripe harvest for him to do his work. And for many of us, the pain of our past is limiting our future. And this is where forgiveness through confession powerfully comes into action and leads me to my next point, authority over the enemy. You may not know this. I don't know what you believe. I don't know. You may not believe in Satan or the devil. You may have no idea. But I want you to know there is an enemy who is very real, and he hates you. And this enemy has a plan that he wants to do, and like it or not, he is bent over the schematics of his plan, and he is scheming over how to trap you and scuttle you and cripple you. Because we know that the enemy is prowling around like a roaring lion, seeking for those that he can devour, and you cannot give him that foothold. I mean, he is at the drawing board, and he is scheming, and he's doing it a whole lot more intentionally than you are at stopping him from doing it. Many of us are trapped in our problems in our past, and it's not because of the sin, and it's not because of the wounds, but it's because of your enemy, Satan. You need to take authority over the enemy. So all throughout scripture, we are told to be alert, 
God has given you authority over Satan and you need to learn how to use it. And this could be a whole sermon series all on its own and one day it will be on the tools of how you can overcome Satan, the fact that you have power and that you can take authority over him. But I want you to focus on this next verse. I want you to hold it. I want you to seize it and understand it for what it is. Ephesians 6, 10 through 12. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle, it's not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So how do you effectively do that? So Satan uses shame and guilt to hold you back, but one of the tools that you have in your arsenal to overcome the enemy is the tool of admitting that you've got issues, that you've got sins. Confessing your sins, that is the beginning of freedom in your life. Romans 8, so now there is no condemnation for those belonging to Christ Jesus. If you want to drink fully from cup two, I want you to listen to this message right here. If you're going to allow that shame and that guilt and that embarrassment that you are in the situation that you are or that you are dealing with the sin that you are, if you're going to allow that to hold you back, you will stay stuck. And as Christians, I think you can agree that we're pretty good as a community of pretending that everything's okay. I'm we have a good veneer of, I'm doing well, how are you, on a Sunday morning. I mean, we're all of us guilty of that. We've learned how to hide our problems. But every single one of us has issues. The person sitting next to you has issues. The person three rows ahead of you has issues. The person in your very seat has issues. And as soon as you say, yep, that's me, I've got them, I have issues, that is the beginning of your freedom. But if you're going to hide behind that condemnation because you don't want people to know that you have because you don't want people to know that you have that sin or issues, then you're never going to be free. So Paul starts the answer with that reminder that there's no condemnation for those found in Christ Jesus. And then he continues in this next verse. And because and because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. But notice the secret to overcoming. He continues, those who are dominated by the sinful nature, they think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit, they think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind, it leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace, to freedom and fulfillment. So I want to ask you a question, thinking about how can I think about good things that, that lead to life, that please the Spirit. I'm gonna ask you this. What has the most control over what you think or how you think? What do you think it is? I'll tell you the answer. I've seen it time and time again. I have seen it over and over. It's the people around you. They help you determine what to think or how to think. You show me your friends. I say this to my kids all the time. Show me your friends. I'll show you your future. It's a fact. So it's all about your association. So if you want to change how you think, how you can be free, how you can move on to God's promises, you have to change your associations, which means, my next point, relationships are the key to this whole thing. So let me show it to you in God's word. Proverbs 28, 13. He who conceals his sins does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. So let's take a look at another scripture, and the scripture that admonishes us, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So remember this, God takes care of what you did. He forgives you but he doesn't make sure you aren't going to do it again. So how do you make sure that you don't do it again? So James 5, 16 goes on and he talks about an additional confession. We confess to Christ and he forgives us, praise the Lord. The additional confession, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. 
God can only forgive you. People can't forgive you. Only God can do that. But the right people in your life can heal you. If you have the right relationships in your life, you're going to be able to fully drink from cup two. So if you get the right people around you, if you surround yourself with the right associations, they will strengthen you spiritually. This is God's recipe. This is not something I came up. He designed it this way. That's why throughout the whole Bible, he refers to people not just as their self. You are the family of God. You are the flock. You are a part of the body of Christ. You are a fellowship. When you are intentional with your friendships and your relationships and you get them right, you grow, you are challenged, and you change. But if you try it by yourself, it's not going to work. The Lord did not create for you to go it alone, and he did not intend for you to be alone. We found that in the pandemic, right? I mean, how unhealthy it became when we did not, did not have social access and accountability, it became very real to us during that pandemic. So confess your sins to Christ for forgiveness, then confess your sins to others for healing. Christ uses the people around you to bring healing and ultimately to bring you freedom because brothers and sisters, you were called to be free. And I'm gonna end with three things. They're very practical. There are three elements that you can walk out in your freedom with Christ Jesus. And they involve going public with your faith, and it also involves other people. And the first one is this, water baptism. So baptism, baptism does not save you, right? It lets the world know that you are saved. Just like this wedding ring does not make me married, it just tells the world that I'm really married to a really good looking guy. So. If you've made this decision for Jesus and you have not yet walked out the next step of baptism, now is your chance. We have a baptismal pool and it is full. And if you would like, and even if at some point in your past you have been baptized, but you want to renew your confirmation with the Lord, you want to tell the world, we have the availability to do that this morning. And so you can go out those back doors and we have people who are gonna direct you over and you can get a shirt and a towel and you can be baptized today. Because this is an important part of your next step. And if you don't wanna get baptized this morning, you can always sign up to get baptized next month. We have baptismal services every month. So the next one is belonging to a church family. And I love this one. You need to join a body of believers and you need to get plugged into the spiritual life of that body. And if your membership is at this church, I am ecstatic and I welcome you to the family of Turning Point. But if it's another church, I pray that you get flourished and that you are planted. I'm just asking you to get planted because it is vital that you become a member of a church and you get plugged into the life-saving life of that community commit to a church and to the fellowship in that church because everybody needs to be a part of the local church. And the last thing, small groups. So this part is also critical. Bad company corrupts good character and friend choices will influence and determine your spiritual health. Small groups are great because they provide an environment where you're challenged, where you feel safe, you're protected, you grow, you admit those sins and those faults to people, they pray for you and you find healing and the Lord grows you in his word. And if you're not involved in a small group, we actually have another small group campaign happening starting in February. And I would encourage you to join a freedom small group. We have those going on and it just takes this message and breaks it down even further on how you can seek freedom. So this is the moment where I'm gonna ask you guys some questions in this service. And so, if you would please just bow your heads and close your eyes. And I'm gonna ask you to be honest. You're gonna be honest with me. I want you to be honest with yourself. But most important, I want you to be honest before the Lord. And he knows the answer anyways, right? You might as well be honest. Are there any areas in your life any issues that you have that you have not yet received freedom from. Areas where you need victory over sin, you need healing from wounds that were done to you, where you need to take authority over Satan. 
I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to ask you to boldly and bravely raise your hand so that I can pray for you. If you have areas in your life that you need freedom from, raise your hand. I'm going to pray over you guys. Father God, you have called us to be free. You did not create us to be stuck. You did not create us to be lost in darkness. You are our shepherd. And right now, Jesus, we are laying before you these areas in our lives that we have allowed to enslave us, Jesus, that we have not completely sought freedom from or received freedom from. So right now, Lord, I am praying for those who raise their hands that your spirit will fill them and that they will receive healing of their wounds, that they will receive victory over their sins, and that, Jesus, you will let them know that they have authority over the enemy, God. But I pray right now that they will walk out of this church this morning knowing that you've called them to be free and that you intend for them to be free. And in your name, Jesus, I pray that they will take hold of that freedom. Powerfully work in their hearts and in their minds and in their lives, Jesus. May this be a testimony of your grace and your power in their lives, Lord. We know that you are doing a great work and it's all for the sake of your name and the glory of your name. But I pray for these individuals, Jesus. Help them to find that freedom and that healing in you, Lord. And then I'm going to ask the next question. Have you made a commitment to believe in Jesus? Ephesians 3.12 says, In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and with confidence. But if you don't think this morning that you could approach God with freedom, and with confidence, now is your time to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised from him from the dead and you will be saved. So if you have not yet made that commitment to Jesus, I want you to boldly raise your hand right now and I am going to pray for you. Lord, I lift up those to you in this room this morning who have not yet made a commitment to you or who are making that commitment again in your name, Lord. Flood their hearts, flood their minds, flood them, Jesus, with your presence that they know that they, they are your child and that you love them and that you see them and that you are welcoming them home into eternity with you, Lord. I thank you for everyone in this room who has made a commitment to you, Lord, who is seeking your power, who is seeking your spirit to move in them. I pray that your word will challenge us this morning. Go forth with us. We thank you, Jesus, for how you are at work in us. We love you, Lord, and we pray this in your awesome name. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and give a hand to the Lord for those who made a commitment to Jesus.
Hi, my name is Don Teets. Um, I've been going to Turning Point since, uh, I believe, about 1995. I've uh, been involved in an awful lot of uh, overseas mission work with uh, MOVE um, since 1999, or 90, excuse me, 1998, and uh, was been on, went on multiple MOVE trips up through 2016 and was director of MOVE for several years. It's been just a great thing to be able to to uh, be a part of mission trips, and and it really is something the Lord put in my heart. And right now, uh, I'm a part of the Dream Team, and the Dream Team, basically the Go Missions Team, uh, was able when I stepped back from being Move leadership, uh, the Lord really had put in my heart to to come back to my own church instead of being on a national level and and share some of that the love that he's given me for that type of, of uh, ministry. We uh, were able to go to Cambodia a couple of years ago and did a tremendous, this church gave such a tremendous amount of funds to, to be able to put the uh, solar panels up on the church in Cambodia. Uh, just a, a, a great thing. We had a great group of people come in, truly enjoyed that, and uh, it was a great success. Back uh, last year, the Dream Team's purpose was to go to, our mission was to go to Dominican Republic. We were gonna follow the MOVE team there. They had gone there to uh, put up, basically the first thing they did was they put up a basketball court and, and then they went back to tear down a building that was, that was failing and rebuild a school building for the church down there. And when they were done, they, had, they still had some things that needed to, be, needed to happen and our team was gonna go over there and put in walls and uh, block walls and windows and help to finish that school. Well, with all the things that had happened with COVID and, and the, the concerns about travel, we weren't able to really put together a team to do that, but this church just so lovingly gave an amount of $15,000 down there to the church in Dominican Republic to allow them to buy all the block they needed and the windows and doors towards completing that school. And uh, the great thing about that is, is the windows and doors, or the, the block has been put up, and it, it's uh, just a tremendous picture to see. Uh, I spoke with Pastor Raul just recently, and he was just so excited about what this church has done and given. Every time I speak with him, it's just been, this is just a, such a great gift that the people of Turning Point have done in, in passing these funds along to help them complete that school kids will be going back to school there it sounds like within about the next month or so I can't stress enough just the gratitude that comes from the people in Dominican Republic and Pastor Raul for the amount of, of giving that this church has done to be able to support that ministry over there it's made such a huge difference and it's allowing them to be able to complete the, the project that they've started so our dream team this year has been looking at going to uh, to Nogales, Mexico. Basically, we're going to be going to Imeris, Mexico is the goal. We're going to be going down there to work with Faith and Bill McConnell, who have a great ministry going down there in Del Brown. And uh, we're just ex we're excited about the opportunity to go there. There's so many opportunities for ministry there that they have functioning. Part of it will be, of course, we always love to have a little bit of construction. Just several handyman type, minimal construction type issues that just anybody can lend a hand to. They also have just so many ministries down there and, and it, that we can be a part of the children's ministry down there and the, there's a prison ministries where they have men's prison ministries to work with, women's and, child, and youth prison ministry. Um, they have a men's rehab down there where it's a drug rehab session. And it's just a great, great opportunity to have a lot of different things to do down there that would just about fit anybody. We're also looking into the possibility of doing some medical and dental work down there. Uh, it hasn't been ironed out yet, but that's, I think that'll be a part of what we're gonna be doing. Um, right now we're still in the process of lining everything out, but there is just a great variety of things that we can do. It's just gonna fit anybody that would wanna go on a trip. The dates right now are looking like it could be June 21st through June 30th of 2023. So you'll be back in time for 4th of July. In about a month, we'll have uh, the information will be on tpob.org where you'll be able to find all the information regarding the trip. Also, there'll be a link there so you can go to, that you can follow 
to fill out the application. And once that application is filled out and we get a few applications in, we'll get, a, get start getting informational meetings together and we'll start planning and, and setting up this trip for everyone to enjoy and, and be able to be a part of ministering to the people in Mexico. Thank you.